If you've watched this series to now, then well done. We're in the home straight, and hopefully we'll get something running. We've had a close look at the Ben Eater implementation of the SAP1, and now we want to add some muscle to the bone. Previously, we've built the W bus, the register bank, the sequencer controller, the program counter, and now we're looking at the ALU. In this video, we're going to concentrate on the status register, and we'll look at decimal adjust in the next one. Right now, though, I want to see if I can get a game to work without decimal. I'm adjusting the emulator so that the decimal flag is always clear. It should act like the Rico 2AO3, which was used in the Nintendo Entertainment System. This is a 6502 derivative without decimal mode. Let's compile it, and we'll see if Pac-Man can run. It looks like the main issue is with the score. It's normal up until we hit 9, and then it displays garbage. This then continues until we get back to 0. High score is also affected in the same way. What it means for this build is once I get status working, I should be able to play Pac-Man minus the score. In the last video, we replaced the 203 adders that Ben Eady used with some 74HC181 ALU units. This can handle all the logic and arithmetic instructions within the 6502, with the exception of shift right. For that, we needed an extra 74HC245. Now we'll implement the status register, which is tightly coupled with the ALU, and we'll start off by looking at how Ben Eater did it. He calls it the flag register instead of the status register, but you can see it here on the left-hand side of the schematic. A single 74HC173 contains the carry and zero flags. So what flags do we need in our status register? Well, it's determined by the instruction set. Ben Eda added jump on carry or jump on zero to Albert Paul Malvino's design, and this is the main use of the flags. The clock in signal to the 74HC173 comes via the flag in or FI signal, which is generated by the sequencer controller. So, how exactly are these flags generated? Let's say we want to add these two numbers, ED and 13 in hexadecimal. We go through the normal process and it generates a result of zero, but there's a leftover carry. Instead of ignoring it or throwing it away, we store it in our carry flag. Now, this is a special example because the result's zero. This is often very useful to know, so there's some hardware that if it detects a zero, sets the zero flag. Any other output and the zero flag is cleared. In Ben Eater's design, the carry out from the adder goes directly to the status register. But zero is a little bit more complicated. We have this bank of NOR gates. When all their inputs are zero, all the outputs should be one. Then we have these three AND gates, which detect the output of the NOR gates. If the output from the adder is zero, then the output from the leftmost AND gate will be one. But if even just one of the inputs is one, then the output from the leftmost AND gate will be zero. This logic therefore detects a zero, and it feeds it straight into the flag register. In turn, the two outputs from the flag register, the carry flag and the zero flag, go straight back to the sequencer controller. There, they're connected to some of the address lines on the EPROMs, and they can directly impact the sequence of micro-instructions. But remember, it's only the conditional jump instructions that use this. Now let's look at the status register used by the 6502. It has a carry and zero flag, and these are very similar to the ones on Ben Eater's machine. The other two flags we're going to have to look at now are the overflow and negative flags. The decimal flag we'll worry about next video. The overall architecture for the status register in the SAP 6502 is quite different to Ben Eater's design, and that's due to the more complex instruction set. To start with, the PHP and PLP instructions either push the contents of the status register to the stack, or pull the stack and write the value into the status register. To do this, the W bus is going to need read and write access to the status register, so let's start the design with this in mind. To store each flag within the status register, I'm going to use these D-type flip-flops inside the 74HC74. Unfortunately, there's only two per package, so I'm going to need about three of these in total. The advantage is, on top of the normal D and clock input, 
They also have a preset and clear input. When these are both high, then it acts like a normal D-type flip-flop. On the positive edge of clock, the D-input is transferred to the output. Otherwise, the output just holds the value that was previously clocked. Preset is an active low input. When it goes low, the output goes high, and this completely overwrites what was happening with clock and D. Similarly, when clear goes low, the output goes low, and again, this is independent of what's happening with clock and D. If we look at the 6502 status register, we see that carry is bid zero. This means we want a single D-type flip-flop to store carry. Houston, we have a problem. The output from the flip-flop's always on, but we want to connect it to a tri-state bus. To do this, we just add a 74HC245 buffer, which we've seen before. The output will go tri-state when ST reg OE is high. Remember, this signal is generated by our decode logic in the sequencer controller. The D input to the flip-flop comes directly from the W bus, and this is clocked via the ST reg clock signal. This is also generated in the decode logic in the sequencer controller. This thing has its tentacles everywhere. So how does the ALU control the carry flag? Well, that's what the preset and clear signals are for. We'll look at these in more detail in a moment. For now, we just replicate this circuit for the zero flag, the interrupt and decimal flags. Without interrupt, we don't actually need registers for bits four and five, but we do need them for the overflow and negative flags. In total, we need three 74HC74s and a single 74HC245. You can see these chips here on the prototype, and underneath you can see the yellow wires connecting the W bus. The sequencer controller also needs to be able to read the status register, but fortunately the branch instructions only use one bit of the status register at a time. This means we can use the 8 to 1 multiplexer we saw in the sequencer controller, and we only use up one address line. I've gone over the operation of the 74HC151 in a previous video. Three flag bits from the controller sequencer are used to select an input, where each of the data inputs come from one of the flags. Note that I've substituted in upper and page at bits 4 and 5. I can connect up the other six inputs to the outputs of the various flip-flops. So far so good, now we just have to deal with these dangling set and clear inputs. Most of these will be generated by some form of combinatorial logic, but they're connected up to asynchronous set and clear inputs. I'm worried that as the logic settles, we may get spurious inputs to set and clear. I'm going to try and clean up the signals with this Octal D type flip flop, so hopefully the logic will have a chance to settle before it can change the flag. OK, let's start off with zero. I'm going to use this tree of OR gates to generate the zero signal. I need to connect it up to the W bus so I can detect zero from both the ALU and the shift right logic. When all the inputs on the left are zero, the output on the right will be zero as well. But if any or all of the inputs are 1, the output will be 1. It's essentially acting as an 8 input OR gate. This is a little different to Ben Eater's design, but it's serving the same purpose. One of the tricky things with the 6502 is that we don't always want to use the result from this zero tree. For example, the transfer stack pointer to X instruction can set or clear the zero flag. But a very similar instruction, transfer X to the stack pointer, doesn't impact the flags at all. This means we're going to need a control signal from the sequencer which tells us when to update the flags. Now, it turns out that every instruction that updates the zero flag updates the negative flag at the same time, so we can combine these update signals. The idea is to use the update NZ signal to decide whether the zero tree either sets or clears the zero flag. Remember that these raw signals still have to go to a flip-flop before they can set or clear the flag. Also, update NZ, set zero, and clear zero are all active low signals. 
So, when update NZ is 1, both clear zero raw and set zero raw will also be 1. You really need to double check your thinking with this sort of logic. It's really easy to get bitten. That's the zero flag done. Now let's look at carry. This is a bit more tricky than negative because there are instructions that can directly set or clear the carry flag. CLC clears carry and SEC sets carry. The interrupt, overflow and decimal flags can also be set and cleared in this way. Well, technically, overflow can only be cleared. There's no set overflow instruction. We have an output from the sequencer, which tells us we need to execute one of these instructions. And we can use the 74HC138 3 to 8 decoder, directly connected to the instruction register, to determine which of these operations need to occur. For now, we can just directly connect up the interrupt and decimal signals to their associated flip flop whereas the carry signals and the overflow signal need to be anded with some signals from the ALU before they go to the flip-flop. This way, both the 138 and the ALU have control over these signals. Connecting up clock to the 138 means that the decoder logic should have a chance to settle before the results outputted. So I think I can get away without using a flip-flop on these. This is quite a bit different to Benita's design, but the complex instruction set of the 6502 demands we do it. Generating carry within the ALU is also more complex, and I'll use this add with carry instruction to show why. Specifically, add with carry in the zero page X addressing mode. Let's say we happen to have 75 and 84 hexadecimal in sequential memory locations. We decode the 7.5 as the add with carry instruction, and we want to move the 8.4 into the A hold register. We copy the A7 in the index register into the B register, then we do an addition, and we want the result to go into the effective address low register. We want the carry in to be zero, and we need to make sure it's not done in decimal mode. We ignore the carry out, and we just write zero into the effective address high register. None of the flags should be affected by this first addition. The effective address registers now point to zero page location 2B. We fetch the value stored there, which is AA hexadecimal, and we want to add this to the value in our A register. But this time, we want to use the carry in from the carry flag, and we want the result to impact the carry, negative, zero, and overflow flags. Two 8 bit additions done by the ALU, but with very different impacts on the status register. Let's have a look at the microcode for this instruction. But don't forget I'm doing a whole series on microcode. Step zero is fetch, where we read the instruction from the main memory and store it in the instruction register. Steps one through four are decode. We copy the value in the X register into B. Then we read the operand for the instruction into the A hold register. We do an ALU add and store the result in the EAL register and we write zero into the EAH register. In step five, which is the first part of execute, we do a main memory read from the address pointed to by the effective address registers, and we store the result in the B register. We copy the contents of the accumulator into the A hold register. And finally, we do an ALU add, and we write the result into the A register. Now don't worry too much if you didn't follow all of that, the important point is that for the first ALU addition, we told it to use a carry in value of zero, and we explicitly told it not to use decimal mode. For the second addition, we didn't mention decimal or carry in, but we do want to update the negative, zero, carry, and overflow flags. The take home message is that we want precise control over how the ALU uses and updates the status register. We've already seen that carry can come from the instruction, but where is it generated in the ALU? Well, the 74HC181 has both a carry in and a carry out signal. These are both active low, and we know how much we love doing Boolean algebra with active low signals. For now, we can just connect the carry out from the top chip to the carry in on the bottom chip, but I'm going to need to change this later when we do decimal adjustment. I'll worry about that then. It would be nice if we could just gate the carry out from our ALU signal with our update C signal, but we have another problem. 
A right shift can generate a carry signal, but this time it comes from bit 0 of the input value. To solve this, we can use a 2 to 1 multiplexer, which takes the carry output from the ALU and bit 0 from the B register, and selects between them based on the shift right bit. Where does this shift right bit come from? You guessed it, the sequencer controller. Maybe now you can start to understand why I think of it as being like the Puppet Master. As I've already mentioned, I'm doing an entire playlist on how to write the microcode for the sequencer controller. Now, we still have the carry into the ALU to worry about. Generally, we just use the output from the carry flag, but we've already seen there are some situations where we want the carry in to be a hard 0 or a hard 1. Two more signals to add to the sequencer controller. This little circuit up the top integrates these signals with the carry bar signal before it goes into the ALU or shift right buffer. Next is the negative flag, which is just normally connected up to bit 7 of the result. When using 2's complement, this tells us that the number's negative. Ideally, we could just use bit 7 from the W bus, gated by the update NZ signal, to generate the raw, set or clear signal, which ultimately control the flip-flop storing the N flag. But there's a fly in the ointment with this as well. The bit instruction uses bit 7 from the input to control the negative flag, rather than bit 7 from the output. We need another 2 to 1 multiplexer to choose between bit 7 from the W bus or bit 7 from the B register. This is under the control of the bit op signal, and no prizes for guessing where this comes from. In a previous video, I showed the maiden voyage of the Ariane 5 rocket. Let's watch it again with the correct audio this time. So far, so good, but now let's fast forward to 37 seconds after launch. Tous les paramètres propulsifs sont normaux et la trajectoire est normale. Believe it or not, this explosion was caused by an integer overflow. The overflow caused a type of interrupt called a trap. The inertial guidance system went into diagnostic mode, and it started out putting CPU status instead of telemetry. Shortly afterwards, the backup unit did the same thing for the same reason. Now, somewhat ironically, the variable that caused the overflow wasn't even being used after launch. It was calculated and then thrown away but it could still impact the status register. This is one of the most infamous and expensive computer bugs in history, so it is worth taking a moment to try and understand how integer overflow works. Let's say I want to add these two numbers together. 6D and 7.5 gives E2 in hexadecimal. But in 2's complement form expressed in decimal, this is the same as adding 109 to 117 and getting a result of minus 30. We've added two positive numbers and ended up with a negative number. This is an overflow, and it occurs when the sign of the output isn't appropriate given the sign of the inputs. For addition, this occurs when we have two positive numbers and we get a negative result, or we have two negative numbers and we get a positive result. Adding a positive number to a negative number is always within range and will never generate an overflow. You might want to stop and think about this for a moment. For subtraction, the overflow occurs if we subtract a negative number from a positive number and end up with a negative number, or we subtract a positive number from a negative number and end up with a positive number. Again, you might want to stop and think about this for a little while, and maybe try and think up some examples. First, the ALU needs to know if it's doing an addition or a subtraction, more puppet strings, then we can generate an overflow by comparing bit 7 of A with bit 7 of B, and bit 7 of A with bit 7 of the result. We need to handle the special case of the bit instruction, where bit 6 of one of the inputs goes through the overflow flag. Once more, we use a 2 to 1 multiplexer under the control of the bit op instruction. The output is gated by the update V signal, 
And finally, the last bit of logic I need for now is the page flag which I generate from carry 8. This unusual looking circuit is just a D-type latch. When ALUOE is high, then the carry 8 signal goes through to the output. But when ALUOE goes low, then the previous value at carry 8 is latched into the flip-flop. This lets me use the P flag for many micro instructions after the ALU operation. Let's see if our status register works. I ran Apple II Pac-Man on the Apple Win emulator and stopped it at the first set decimal instruction. I dumped the entire memory map into a file. I changed the reset vectors and I wrote some code that sets the stack pointer and other CPU registers. I burnt this into an EEPROM and added some code to transfer it into the static RAM. This occurs after the map's already been drawn, so we should be seeing incremental updates to the score Pac-Man and the Ghosts. Clearly this isn't working. Well, I don't think there is any question about it. It can only be attributable to human error. After some debugging, I found out that it wasn't branching appropriately. It was actually kind of arbitrary as to whether a branch would occur or not. I started poking around the board, and eventually I found this. It's the octal D-type flip-flop in the status circuit, and both the clock and output enable inputs appear to be floating. There's no signal on them. I flipped the board over and had a look underneath, and sure enough, there was nothing connected to these pins. This affects these two signals on the 74HC574, so it's really not surprising that the flag bits weren't being updated appropriately. Let's give this another try. Well, it's looking more Pac-Man-like, but it's still not correct. The ghosts shouldn't be going straight down, and Pac-Man should be going left instead of right. This sort of thing has cropped up before, and it has always been due to human error. I rechecked all the new logic, and I found this problem. When carry 8 bar is set, it has the impact of setting carry. When bit 0 of the B register is 0, it also sets carry, and this is just clearly wrong. It looks like the top one is supposed to be set carry raw, and the bottom one is supposed to be clear carry raw. I told you having too many double negatives can bite you. Let's try it again. Ooh, that's looking much better. DSAP 6502 is playing Pac-Man. It's sending the pixel data through the Arduino to a PC and then the PC is displaying it on this screen. I've sped up by a factor of 10 so we can get to the next life, where hopefully it'll draw the entire maze. Let's see if it happens. Ooh, and there we go. I haven't connected up the keyboard yet, so I can't get the score high enough to see if it's counting in hexadecimal or not, but I'll worry about that next video. Although the SAP1 design is very simple, it can be bulked up to run 6502 assembly code. That's it for now, but don't forget to like, share and subscribe, and I think I'm going to take a victory lap.